Good morning. Excuse me. That's a great way to start off, isn't it? <laughs> Good morning. Happy Monday. Glad that you're here with us on this uh, nice, cool fall morning. Um, it is the 27th of September. We're almost in uh, the leaf-changing month of October. I'm, I love this time of year. I'm just going to tell you, get into October. It's just right for me. It's, it's just cool enough to be cool and build campfires and do stuff like that, but it's not freezing, and uh, I like it. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I like this time of year, and a lot of change happening in the seasons this time of year, and, and you know, it, it just seems like that's happening in our lives too. And, uh, you know, we're, we're starting a new thing. Speaking of change, we just finished a uh, really great study on the book of Ephesians and not great because I was teaching it. It was great in spite of the fact that I was teaching it. Ephesians is a great book. It's it's just full of great stuff. Well the Lord Lord's leading me into Philippians now. We're gonna get into Paul's letter to the Philippians and gonna talk a lot about that over the next I don't know how long. Uh, maybe through the end of the year. I don't know. It may I don't know how long it's gonna take. But uh, we're going to get started today, and I hope you enjoy it. I hope it's encouraging to you and helps you grow in your faith. It's, it's one of the most encouraging letters in the New Testament. Uh, but it's not, it's not a letter that, that escapes the reality of suffering and difficulty and problems. In fact, it talks a lot about that. But it, it faces it with hope and joy and strength. And I love that. I, we're living in times when we just need that. Uh, we don't need to escape from the realities of the world we're in, and we don't need to. But we don't need to get so obsessed with the problems that we don't have any hope, right? So we've got to find a way to to have hope, to be realistic about what the challenges are around us, but also to have hope. Uh, we're God's people. We're a people of hope. We're not a people of despair. We're not. Uh, I, I don't know why people think it's Christian to uh, to give up and to quit. That's that's not. What, what I read in the New Testament. Paul sure didn't do that. Anyway, I don't want to start preaching right away. I want us to pray, but I just want to invite you. Um, as often as you're able, I don't expect anybody to watch this every day, but um, I'm going to be numbering the messages so that I can have them better organized. I'll be putting my Ephesians one in a group as soon as I can get that done. You can have that to, to study, listen to, whatever you want to do with it, uh, make fun of it, whatever. And now this one, I'm going to number each of the messages so at the end... We're able to put them in a good order, and you can have those if you want them. And so, and uh, the price it remains the same because of inflation. I'm going to have to double my price from zero to double zero. And so, hope that's not too bad for you. But anyway, I want you to I want you to enjoy these, and feel free anytime you want to share one of these. You don't even have to ask; just share them. Um, share them with people. Love to get the word of God out as far as it'll go. And so, you just share it like crazy if you want to. Um, I don't mean to be presumptuous, but the Word of God's good, and uh, it's worth sharing. I'm not that hot, but the Word of God's great. And so, anyway, let's let's pray, and let's, let's dive into Philippians. Father, thank you for your grace and love. Thank you for your faithfulness, your goodness, for your mercy. Thank you, Lord God, for who you are and uh, how you, you love us and you keep us in your hand. Uh, Lord... Even in our worst moments, you're good. Your grace is always sufficient, Lord. And Father, even when we face challenges and we don't know how to navigate them, Lord, you keep us in your hands. Lord, we just thank you so much. Now we pray as we enter into this new study. Lord, would you bless it? Would you um, bring in the harvest? Would you uh, touch and encourage the saints? And would you draw people into your kingdom? And Lord, would you bless the reading and the preaching and the doing of your word. Uh, help us, Lord, as we seek to know you better. Thank you for all you've done for us in Jesus Christ. And Lord, it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Again, I'm, I'm, I welcome you. I'm glad. Let me, let me do this. Uh, I want to, you know, I hadn't planned on doing these book studies online, but just kind of fell, fall, fell into it. And so we did Ephesians. I'm going to have that up for you. And now we're going to do Philippians. I don't know if the Lord's going to, you know, what the Lord wants to do about that. But I, I want to give an little introduction to the book. It's a great book um, written by the Apostle Paul about 30 years, about A.D. 62, about 30 years 
into uh, the movement after Christ rose from the dead. Uh, Paul has been a, a Christian about 30 years. He's been serving and been through a lot of experiences. He's now, most scholars believe he's imprisoned in Rome. Um, there's good reason to believe that. He's, he's in a prison in Rome writing this letter. And I'm, I'm just amazed that anybody can be sitting in a Roman prison in the first century and those rat holes that they call prison and then be writing a letter that's so full of encouragement and joy and hope. Uh, it always tells me, you know, if Paul can dream from prison, I can dream from where I am. If Paul can believe from prison, I can believe from where I am. You know what I'm saying? And so remember, whatever your situation is, uh, you can dream. You can believe God and you can, you can pursue the things he has for you. And you can fulfill his call in your life. Because Paul shows us just in this simple letter that it's the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and it's not our power. It's not how good we are for God. It's how great God is through us as we surrender to him. And so that's what this letter is about. Now, Paul... Well, it's, it's full of encouragement, it's full of challenge, it's full of hope. Um, it's a letter that, that will just fill your heart with hope and peace. And, and so now he's writing to a, a city called Philippi. Philippi, uh, named after Philip of Macedon, and, uh, you know, way back earlier than this, it, it was called Little Rome because the architecture and the way it was laid out and all the stuff it had was so much like Rome that they called it Little Rome. In fact, it was founded, when it was founded, they, uh, they, they started out with a bunch of retired generals. This, it was a place where Roman generals would go to retire, kind of like Florida. You know, everybody wants to go to Florida to retire. Um, and, and so this is, they go to Philippi to retire. So can imagine Paul preaching to all these Roman, re retired Roman generals, you know. And, it, and so all this kind of stuff. And it was the very first church in what we call the European continent. It, it started in uh, in e what we would call Eastern Europe. And Rome called it Macedonia. We call it Eastern Europe. And uh, that's where it began. And it started at a prayer group by a river. A group of praying women hanging out by the river. And uh, Paul preached the gospel to them down by the river. A woman named Lydia believed she was the first European convert to Christianity, as far as we know, and she uh, she began the church in her house. She invited. She was a merchant, a successful businesswoman. If she sold purple, that means she made some serious money. She was a wealthy, successful woman, and she brought the church into her house, and it began. And I love the first the stories of the Church of Philippi because it started out with a a businesswoman. A slave girl, formerly possessed, demonized slave girl, and a correctional officer, you know, a, a jail guard. And uh, those were the first prominent people we see beginning the church. Uh, it wasn't begun by, by a, a bunch of religious experts. It wasn't started by a bunch of people who, who went to seminary and had all this training. It was people who didn't even know what a, what a Christian was. And, and God began this church in Philippi with this small nucleus of really different people, totally different from each other, really strange characters. And Paul, Paul ministered to them, and they were the, the, the beginning people of the church in Philippi. And it's, it's interesting, if you read in Acts chapter 16, how this church got started. You know, Paul was trying to, trying to do his travels, and he wanted to go north, and the Holy Spirit wouldn't let him. And so he tried to go west, the Holy Spirit wouldn't let him. And so he went to Troas, which we remember, the ancient city of Troy. Well, this is the same place. And so Paul is in this place. He don't know where God's leading him. He, everywhere he tries to go, the Lord says, no, he can't go there. No, he can't go there. Shutting the door everywhere he goes. And it wasn't because God was mad at him. He was trying to redirect him. And he, he was trying to aim him into Europe. He had never been to that part of the world before. It was an entirely different culture, an entirely different people. Uh, something totally new to Paul. And so Paul steps into this new place he'd never even seen before. And he goes into Europe with the gospel. He crosses over into Philippi. And he preaches the gospel there in a river with a bunch of women down there doing their laundry. And he 
He preaches the gospel. Lydia believes. She starts the church in her house. And then while they're there, Paul's going through the city, right? And he gets followed around by this little girl who's a slave. Uh, she's being used uh, uh, and is possessed by a devil. And she's being used kind of like a psychic. She's telling fortunes and stuff like that by this evil spirit. And so she's following Paul and Timothy around trying to, trying to advertise for them. These men are showing you the way of truth. Well, you know, you can't really attach your ministry to the devil. So Paul turns around and he says, he tells that demon to come out of her. Well, that's great for her, but the, the men who are making money off her really get mad because their source of income is gone, right? And so they throw Paul in prison. He gets beat. He gets thrown in prison. He and Silas are in prison together, and they are in the middle of the night. They're singing praises to God. Now, guys, they don't know what's about to happen. They just know they're in prison. They know they're singing praises to God because God is worthy. They're not saying, oh, if we sing praises to God, he'll do a miracle. No, they're just praising him. They're just praising him. And as they're singing to God, an earthquake happens. The doors fly open, and all the prisoners are about to escape. And so the jailer uh, knows that if his prisoners get away, he's going to die. So he starts to kill himself. He gets his sword. He gets ready to go. And Paul says, wait, don't harm, harm yourself. We're still here. And so Paul, uh, the jailer says, well, what do I, says these great words. These are the great words that the jailer says, what must I do to be saved? When he sees the compassion and the selflessness of Paul and Silas, he, he wants whatever they've got. What must I do to be saved? And they say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, you and your house. And uh, so he takes them to his house. And his whole house is baptized. His whole house believes. And um, Paul, they wash out Paul's wounds and, and they send him on his way. But see, the thing is, is that the magistrates want Paul just to leave town quietly because they know that they had beat a Roman citizen and they weren't supposed to do that. Paul wasn't guilty of anything and they knew they were in trouble, right? They were trying to cover it up. So the, the, the officials said, well, let's just scoot him out of town quietly and we won't be embarrassed. And Paul says, no. No, you're going to come walk me out of town. You know, sometimes Christians have got to stand up. And Paul says, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sneak out quietly. I'm not going to save you from what you did. I'm going to, I'm going to, you're going to come out here and you're going to march me out of town. Why? So that the whole town will know that the Christian movement is not corrupt. And the Christian movement is not something uh, to be uh, treated badly. And, and the Christian movement is not a bad thing. And so he wanted the world to know. He wanted the city of Philippi to realize that he wasn't in the wrong and that this, this was not some weird pagan scandalous organization. This was the church of Jesus. And then it was above board. And, it was, and so they marched him out of town. And Paul goes, well, later on, he writes back to this church from prison because they're the only church. When you read the rest of this letter, they're the only church that is still supporting him while he's in prison. All the others have pretty much uh, written him off. And, <clears throat> and so he's feeling kind of alone. One church stays faithful to Paul, and it's Philippi. Now, why am I telling you all this stuff? Because I want you to see the, the bond that Paul has with this church. That they've been through a lot together. They've suffered together. They've been through a lot, and, and they were the ones that stayed faithful to him in his worst times. They stayed true to him, and he appreciated that. And he's writing this letter basically to say, thank you for sticking with me. Thank you for standing by me. Thank you for sending support and helping me, and, and thank you. And, uh, but also wanted to challenge them to live their faith boldly in little Rome. Live your faith boldly in little Rome. Stand up for the gospel. Be the men and women of God he called you to be. Serve each other. Love each other. Stand together for the gospel. And Paul talks about this throughout his letter. And so, what? <coughs> excuse me, this has a lot to say to us today. This has a lot to say to us. You know, we've been through a lot in the last year or so. We've been through some uh, some suffering. We've been through some struggle. And now our suffering doesn't compare to his. And, and, and we don't need to compare suffering. The fact of the matter is you've been through some hard times. If you're a Christian and you've stood up for your faith, you've had some tough times. Now, it may not be as tough as somebody halfway around the world, but it's tough for you and it matters to God. You have given something and you have, you've been through some things and God sees that and he cares about that. But now, now, I've got to tell you all this background stuff. 
so that you can get what we're going to read in these next these first verses. Because Paul is writing this letter just thanking God for this great church and for their love and their faithfulness and all that kind of stuff. Now that you know all this, you can be thinking about it as you, as you listen to this. We're going to start in, in verse 3. In verses 1 and 2, he gives us greeting, Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Philippi, right? And then he goes to verse 3, he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. You see that? He's remembering how they started. He's remembering their support and their faithfulness. He's remembering them, right? Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making prayer with joy. You know, there are some people that when you pray for them, it just brings you joy. Because they, they, they're the people that have stood with you. They're the people that have prayed with you and stood with you and linked arms with you. And, and, and some of you pastors, you know what this is like. I know what this is like. I love all my folks. But there are those people that have stood with me in the ministry over the years. And they're my partners. All of you are my brothers and sisters. But they're people who have been there in the battle. There have been the people who stood right beside me in the struggle. And those people always stand out when you pray. Um, he says, I, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Now, here's where we get to the message. The message is called Unfinished Business. You know, my desk and my wood shop are a testimony to the power of unfinished business. Man, I got stuff that I've started and hadn't finished. I've got half half done projects in my yard, and so do you. And I've got stuff on my desk, papers on my desk, of books I've started reading. I got a stack of books that are half read. I've got papers and stuff that the stuff that I'm planning to finish, but it's not done yet, right? And I look at those things and I think about God. And I think about how God has started a work in you that when you became a believer in Jesus Christ, God started a great work in you. He started healing and saving and redeeming and changing. And, and he's, he's saying, you know, uh, I've started something special in you. Now, I, 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 my walk with Jesus began for me when I was 17 years old. And I'm, I'm 50. Uh, hey, how old am I? 58. And so I'm almost 40 years into this thing. And I've been, I've been following Jesus for those years. And he has been so faithful to me. And I, and I can look back on the, on the days of, of starting out. And, and I can tell you, I am nowhere near where I used to be. You know, I'm not where I should be, like they say. But I'm sure not what I used to be, right? And so the thing is, is that Paul starts off. Listen to what he says. Because I think you should do this. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you all making prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day till now. Now here's what he's saying. He's saying, friends, I remember how we started. Every time I think of you, I think of where God brought us. And I think of how God brought us through that, that riot in downtown Philippi. How God brought us from... A group of praying women back down by the river up to a full growing powerful church that it is today and I thank God for you and I thank God for the struggle I thank God for the times we've been together you know I know guys that you've been through some struggles this year and I know that a, a year ago a year and a half ago you weren't expecting to be where you are right now and God has done you know we think about the struggles and we think about the difficulties but friend have you thought that maybe it's those struggles we've been through over the last year that God has used to refine us that Paul is remembering fondly even the earthquake and the jailer almost killing himself and and all this kind of stuff the angst of trying to figure out where why isn't God letting me go this way why is he making me go that way and the fear of going into a new continent that he didn't really know the culture and and all that kind of stuff and all the as Paul's reminiscing he's thinking about the good old days and the good old days weren't always that great the good old days were tough but Paul's remembering, you know, God used those beginning days to refine me and to refine us. And he has, he has purified us. He's made us new. I want you to think about where the church was a year and a half ago in this country. Now, I know that we're not where we need to be. But I'm going to tell you what. In the last year and a half, I have heard more solid, 
uh, call for prayer and for holiness and righteousness. Uh, yeah, I've heard the false teaching too. I've heard the nonsense. But I've heard so many churches, I've seen so many churches quietly doing whatever they've got to do to get the gospel to their communities. I've seen people do things, change their whole worship services. I've seen people go completely online and learn a whole new territory of ministry. I've seen people change the way they do things in order to allow God to do something new. And I've seen that in the last year and a half. I've seen a hunger among many of God's people for the real Christianity. Not, not, not this kind of uh, culturized uh, game play and religiosity that we've put up with for so many decades. But I'm talking people really getting serious about getting after God. And, and there are people who've left it. They says, I don't want Christianity. Well, you know what? I think the people who left didn't leave Christianity. They left uh, the, the the Disneyland kind of fun thing that that they were making money off of, and they were enjoying the the fun of it and the glamour. And when the glamour left, they quit. I'm ser I'm serious. There's a, when the glamour left, they quit. And so because that's what they were in love with. But then you get people who were serious about the King, serious about Jesus. They're getting more serious. They're getting more into it. And I really believe you're seeing more of that. But, but look back over the last year. It's been tough, man. It's been tough. And it might get tougher. I'm not saying that's over. But I'm just saying in the last year, I've seen some people wake up. Maybe you've woken up. Maybe, maybe you would share with me that your faith has gone deeper in the last year and a half. Maybe you, you, you've you been through the fire of some things and, and it's caused you to pray more intentionally. It's caused you to dig more into the Word of God. It's caused you to, to worship more intentionally. I, I'm encouraged by that. You ought to be encouraged by that. Because God's doing a refining work in His church. Sometimes we get so focused on what we're doing wrong and we get so beat up over the mistakes of the past that we don't pay attention to the greatness of God's project in us. And Paul starts off saying, every time I remember you, I remember with joy. How do you remember being beaten with rods with joy? How do you remember barely surviving an earthquake with joy? How do you remember that? Because you see the hand of God in it. And you see that God is doing a refining work. Guys, you've been through some stuff this year. But take stock. Take stock. Look at where you've been. There's some unfinished business. There's some stuff that God has begun in you. And you know what that tells us? I'm, I can't wait to get to verse 6 here in the next few minutes. Because verse 6 is the promise that he who began. Well, let me just read it. I'm already there. Let's go. Paul says, I am sure of this. That he who began a good work in you will bring it to the completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul says, look, guys, we are partners. We have been made partners by our suffering. We have been made partners by our difficulties. We have been made partners in the gospel. We've been welded together by the fire of affliction. And maybe you've been, you've felt the heat of that. Maybe you've You've had people uh, write you off because of a stand you made. That, see, that hurts, but that refines your heart because it makes your, your commitment pure. It makes your relationship with God pure. So here's the thing is that you've, you've stood up and you've you said, no, God comes first. And I'm not going to bow to the culture and I'm not going to ask the government for permission to be a Christian. And I'm not going to ask other people for permission to stand up and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to stand for him if I stand alone. Friend, that's refining. That's, that's making you holy. And, and God is pleased and he's proud of you for standing up. So don't, don't give up. But here's the thing. Because of that, God has a promise for you. And here's your promise. You ready? He who began a good work, and God did begin a good work in you. He began a great work. But the word began ought to tell you something. It's a process. It's a building project. That God has started something among you, in you, and you may feel like, well, I'm not everything that I should be. Well, you're not. But that's okay because you're growing. You're getting closer. You're moving forward. And you need to stay after it because you're going to make it. 
How do I know? Because it says he who began the good work will bring it to completion. It doesn't say you will bring it to completion. God's going to bring it to completion. God says in Isaiah, shall I bring to the point of birth and not deliver? Shall I, shall I get started and then give up? God doesn't operate that way. He doesn't walk away from unfinished business. God finishes what God starts. And you ought to, you ought to rejoice in that. That God has saved you. By the blood of Jesus Christ. He has bought you by the precious sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He has redeemed you. He has renewed and restored you. And he has begun a great work in you. And but day by day, little by little, he's changing you into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is teaching you to be more loving, more compassionate, more holy, more faithful, more true, more confident. He's talk, teaching you to walk in the authority that Jesus gave you. He's talk, teaching you to listen to the Holy Spirit. He's teaching you to, to understand his word and to stand to speak boldly and to love your neighbor. He's teaching you those things. He's teaching you about God's idea of justice. The world has this wonky idea of justice that doesn't even look like anything in the scripture. God has a form of justice that's this different. Look at what that says and look at how Jesus went about it. And so here's the thing. He who started this good work is going to bring it to completion. And when is he going to finish it? Paul writes, until at the day of Jesus Christ. What is the day of Jesus Christ? That's the day of his return. Christ is coming back. And Paul mentions his return, the day of the Lord, several times in this letter. He talks about the day of the Lord and how, how the Lord's going to return and make everything right. <clears throat> he will come to reign and rule in glory. And, and so... And those who, who suffer with him, who walk with him, will reign with him. And that's what we're called to be and to do as his, as his sons and daughters. So we've got to be faithful. We've got to, but just trust that God is keeping you. God's holding you by his grace and by his hand. And so you just walk in it. Rest in the promise that he who began a good work is going to finish it. God is going to bring it to completion. He is not going to abandon you because you're having tough times. He's not going to walk away from you because you have difficulties. He's going to stay with you all the way through. And he's going to lead you to a greater place. I believe he's going to lead the church in this country and in this world to a greater place. He's leading us, but he's going to refine us. He's removing some garbage that's not of him. He's removing some compromise. He's removing some, some uh, worldliness. And that there's, there's so much that we've attached ourselves to the things of this world as a church. And he's pulling that away. And he's saying, no, that's not my bride. And he's pulling that away. And so that's why you'll see people quit. You're going to see people leave, leave because what they love is not Jesus. What they love is the glitz and the glamour and the comfort and, the, and all the stuff. And when that stuff disappears, they're going to walk. They're going to walk, but you stay true. You stay true. You stand with him and you hold his hand. He's holding yours because he's going to finish what he began in you. And I, I want to really encourage you today. So here's the thing. He's going to work on you until one of two things happens. Until he comes or until you go. He's not going to stop working in your life until he calls you home or he comes to get you. And so you stay you stay confident. Paul said, I am sure of this. He didn't say, I hope it works out. I am sure that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. How could Paul be sure of that? Paul could be sure of that because he knows the character of God. He knows that the same God who didn't give up on the children of Israel as they constantly rebelled against him in the wilderness is not going to give up on you. And so Jesus, who never gave up on his disciples, no matter how many times they flubbed it up, no matter how many times they messed it up, he stayed faithful and he carried them through. The only one who did not was the one who refused to be carried. And so that's the thing that, that Jesus is holding on to you today. And he's saying, you trust in me. I've got you. And I'm going to finish my project. I've started a great work and I don't start anything that I can't finish. Rest in that confidence today. Rest in the confidence that he has made a promise. That he who began it is going to finish it. Look back over where he's brought you from. That's what Paul started out doing. Look back where he started you from. 
and then look to where he is now and what he has done in you and how you have been refined um, just in the last year. Look where you are now and then get a vision for what God wants to do for you next. He's got great things, but you he calls you to rest in him, to be confident, to be to stand with your partners in the gospel, to 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 see what he has already done and trust him for the great things he's going to do. Friend, don't give up today. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Walk forward, hold your head up high, walk in faith, and believe God because the things he's got for you tomorrow are greater than the things he's already done for you today. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for those who've listened today. Thank you, Lord, for your word and your truth. Thank you, Lord, we can be confident that the one who began a good work in each of us will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Lord, we will stand complete in you because of your holy work and the Holy Spirit who gives us new life. Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace.